stirred up faith in this atmosphere today. There's God's children that came into the house today to say, I believe. And in the end of that song, it says, I believe in the name of Jesus. And you can say that two ways. I believe in the name of Jesus. And you can say, I believe in the name of Jesus. As we step into our time of congregational prayer, I would have Bree read our verse for this week. We're reading from 1 John 5, 15, and it says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. In the message translation of that verse, it says, The kind of confidence that we have, it's as good as ours. That's a word that you can stand on today. When you ask according to his will, it's as good as yours. It might not have just dropped in your lap like a magic gift, but it's as good as yours. Do you believe today? Amen, amen. We put the request on the screen today. We have a few things that, as you know, we've been praying for as a church, as we've been praying for as a body of Christ, and we've already seen God working miracles, and we've already seen testimonies come through, and we've already seen praiseworthy announcements that God has already been doing. So we believe going forward, even before we read through these and pray for these, we believe. We believe that just putting them here and in our hearts, that God is already moving on behalf of his people. Amen? Amen. We know all too well the devastation that hurricanes can cause. We're very familiar. But there is so many places and so many communities that are just being devastated right now. We know that not just the hurricane, but everything that's been happening, the earthquakes and everything that's been going on in our earth and what's been happening, that we continue to pray for those communities. We know that in schools and the teachers and the students, especially the students, I know that a lot of them are your kids, but I get to spend a little bit of time with them every week. They need our prayers. Desperately. If there was ever a generation that needs their faith built up in the home, it's this one. If there's ever a generation that needs parents and a community of believers to stand behind them and say, don't quit, don't look at what the world is saying, this is what we believe, stand on it and see how good your God is, it's this generation. They need it. They need it. Because once they catch that faith, there's no stopping them. But they need people. They need us to stand behind them in our prayer and in standing behind them. We know that there's so many physical needs and emotional needs and mental needs that are going on in our church and in our community. We're going to pray for those today. We're praying for the missionaries and the underground churches that God is on the move. Amen? God is on the move, and it doesn't matter if you are free to meet or not. God can still move, and God still does works, and God still does miracles, and he still builds faith, and he still saves. Amen? So we're going to pray for them today because we have a privilege of being able to gather like this. We're going to pray for those that don't share the same privileges that we do. And we're going to pray for unity today and revival in America. Can you imagine? We're going to pray for it like it's as good as ours. And we're going to continue to pray for our medical and personal and, and frontline workers. If you will bow your heads, lift your hands, get in a posture that you know, if you, even if you want to drop to your knees right now in this moment, there is nothing to stop you from how you want to pray right now in this moment. We come together, though, and we stand on faith, and we stand on Christ alone, the cornerstone, and we begin to pray for these things, and we pray for the communities that have been devastated, that are seeing such torment and such things come from the earth, that are destroying homes, that are destroying families, that are destroying lives. We pray for them. We pray that God would step in and step up and show out like he is. He is a confident God. He knows exactly who he is and what he's capable of. We pray that his hand be upon those communities. We outstretch our hand and we bring not only our faith towards them, but may God put even on your heart right now, if there's something to do that we can reach out, that we can move, that we can be hands and feet and not just the mouths of Christ in this generation and in this world, that we would do it, that God right now you would move and that you would step in and that you would show how good that you are, Lord, that you are still in control, that you still have your hand on your people, Lord God, that you would be with all of those that are there trying to clear out and trying to help those that are moving through these natural disasters, Lord God, that you would be there for each and every 
frontline worker in that aspect, Lord God. Lord, we pray for schools, Lord. We pray for each and every school, not just in our community, Lord God, but all around this globe. We pray for the teachers that are stepping up, Lord God, even especially the ones that are believers, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that they would be able to stand firm in faith in you, Lord God, and that they would continue to be the light and the salt to the students that are walking through those schools, Lord God. We know that there is an agenda of the enemy, Lord God, but we know that there is a plan from you, Lord God, that no agenda of the enemy could ever stop that he could ever stop or derail, Lord God. You are on the move and your plans will always be worked out, Lord God. We pray for your plans to be worked out in the schools and in the teachers and in the students that are there, Lord God, that your light would shine brightly in this dark hour, Lord God, through each and every believer that walks, Lord God. Lord, we pray for the physical needs of your congregation, of your people, of your children, Lord God. You are still a miracle working outstretch healing, Lord God. You are still a get up from your mat and walk kind of God, Lord God. Hallelujah. You are still the kind of God that says, move and let your faith be activated and see the miracle happen, Lord God. And I pray right now, Lord God, even for creative miracles, whether they are here in this building, Lord God, or watching online, Lord God, in, in people's finances, Lord God, those who are hurting right now, Lord God, that you would even begin to work out creative miracles, Lord. I pray that someone reach out and take it today, that someone reach out and claim it today, it is like it is as good as yours. Your healing, your finances, your heart, your family that is broken, God is working on it and healing it right now. Take it like it is as good as yours. Hallelujah. We pray, Lord, for the missionaries that are on a mission from heaven, Lord God. We pray for the underground churches and we pray for those, Lord God, that are being persecuted heavily physically, mentally, being abused, Lord God, by the very world that they're trying to reach for your gospel. We pray for their hearts, Lord. We pray right now, Lord God, that like your word says, that we would not grow tired of doing a good work, Lord God. We pray for each and every missionary and every underground church, Lord God, that they would not grow weary and that they would not grow tired, Lord God, but they would be still and wait on the Lord that they would be still and wait on you, Lord, that you would renew their strength, Lord God, renew their passion, renew their vigor, renew their fight, Lord God, that they would continue fighting to be the light and the salt of this earth, to be the transportation of your good news, Lord God, to all of those around them, Lord God. And we pray for an acceleration of your move upon those places, Lord God, that where one would be saved, now two would be saved. And where three would be healed, now five would be healed, Lord God, that you would accelerate your hand upon those missionaries and upon those mission fields, Lord. Lord, we pray for unity, a unity that cannot be broken, Lord God, that we would be linked together, Lord God, by one spirit, by your Holy Spirit, with the same agenda, with the same mission, to see souls saved, to see people healed, to see the widows comforted, Lord God, and the orphans brought into a new home, Lord God. Lord, we pray that as we become not just the mouths, but the hands and feet, Lord God, that you would bring us together like never before, Lord God, and that we would see an even greater unity than when the church was first birthed, Lord God, that we would see a revival break loose, Lord, uncontrollable, unstoppable, that it would pull us straight from our comfort zones right onto the battlefield, Lord God, and that we would see revival break loose through every mouth, through every heart, through every mind. And, and not just in America, Lord God, but start here. Start with us. We're willing and we are ready, Lord God. Move upon your people. We are willing. Here we are, Lord. Send us for revival. Here we are, Lord. Use our words for revival. Here we are, Lord. Use our hands and feet for your revival. We pray for that unity, Lord God, to become strong and firm in all of us, Lord. And we continue to pray, Lord, for the medical personnel and all the frontline workers, Lord God, that are battling. Lord God, the mental stress, the emotional stress, the families that worry about their family members being out there working in the middle of a crisis like never before, Lord God. There are so many unknown variables, Lord God, and we are fighting an enemy that we don't see, that we can't see, Lord God. But there is a God in heaven, and there is a God in our hearts that moves that protects, that conceals, that covers. Lord, we pray for their hearts and their minds to be comforted with the comfort that brings to action, that brings to faith. Not a sitting on a couch kind of comfortable, Lord God, but the being able to stand in the midst of the waves, crashing in and having peace kind of comfortable, Lord. The kind that says, I'm not going to just sit here and wait. I'm going to stand on my, I'm going to go to my knees before God. And I'm going to fight this fight. 
and I'm going to fight for my mental health, and I'm going to fight for my emotional health, and I'm going to fight for my physical health, because in the presence of God, everything and anything is possible. Lord, we thank you. We glorify your name above every name. And it is only in your name that we can stand here and believe these things to be true and be possible. That without you, Lord God, we're just saying words that sound nice, but with you there is power for it to be done. Let it be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, Lord God. Your will be done in our lives. Thank you, Lord. We worship you and we believe in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Hey family, Pastor Peter here, and we're so excited to give you some updates on the ministry of New Sound Church in Nashville, beginning by introducing you to some of the team. Sean is the newest member of the New Sound family and actually the first person ever baptized at our church. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, he's going to share a little bit about his story and what God has been doing in his life. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, as Pastor Peter mentioned, uh, my name is Sean and I was the first person baptized at New Sound Church. Uh, I actually started attending regularly about five months ago, and at that time I actually moved to Nashville to be a part of New Sound. Prior to this, uh, I, was, I was not living the best life. I had given myself to the Lord over 10 years ago, but the difficulties of life brought me to a place of choosing to walk away from my faith. And I'm sure many of you can relate with this, but it didn't turn out very well. And I just found myself in a hopeless place. But the mentorship and the influence of Pastor Peter and his family brought me here to Nashville and brought me to this community. And over the last five months, this community has been a major influence on life change for me. I've began to rediscover who I am in God and rediscover my identity in Christ. And I'm so happy. I'm, I'm in such a better place than where I was uh, just five short months ago. And so I'm excited for what God is doing here. I'm excited for what God has done in my life over the last five months. And I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for this church, for Pastor Peter as a mentor and a leader in my life, and just the community that I have found here through New Sound. Wow, man, that's incredible. You know, here at New Sound, our vision is to see people find new life in Christ, new relationships with the family of God, a new beginning in their God-designed purpose, to be empowered to release a new sound in the world. Sean is just stepping out into his new beginning with Jesus, and we're thrilled to be walking on this journey with him. Please continue to pray for him and our community as we pursue all that God has for us. Um, another update is just this past weekend, uh, we were excited to celebrate the baptism of Gabrielle Hicks. Um, she had been feeling like this was a step of obedience that God was calling her to take, and her family and friends traveled uh, to come see her and witness this monumental moment in her life. And so we're just excited for all that God is doing and is continuing to do through the life of this community. And so thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your support. It really is making a difference. If I could say one last thing, it really would just be a, a genuine thank you from the bottom of my heart. It is your continued prayer and support of New Sound in this community that is changing lives. And I'm just one example of that. And I'm excited to see all of the other examples that are coming uh, in the future. Amen. So thank you so much. Thank you. I get, I get so excited. I spoke to Pastor Peter on the phone this last week, and we try to do about once a month an hour session on the phone where we share and we pray. We pray for one another. We pray together. And um, I'm going to tell you something. That guy's got a pioneer spirit. He just loves just getting right in there, getting where uh, the hurting people are. Uh, he's not about trying to find people that are leaving a church and looking for a church. He's trying to find people that don't know what church is and that really don't know anything about Christ. And he is so geared towards that kind of harvest. And, and I'm just so proud of him. And when I speak to him, he actually inspires me. He tells me every time, Pastor, you just inspire me. When I get off the phone, you just don't know how much that means to me. And I, I tell him, I said, bro, you don't know how much you inspire me. You just put so much excitement and passion in me and life in me. 
We've been a part of their vision and a part of their ministry for several years, as most of you know. And uh, we, this morning, are going to be at the end of the service giving you an opportunity to give a special offering. So if you would like to give a special offering this morning, we encourage you to do that, separate from your tithing offering. Then you can earmark that either in your giving envelope, write the check out to Parkway Life Church, but on the memo, write New Sound. Uh, or Nashville, either one of those. We'll know what that's for. But we would encourage you to do that, and I know it will be a tremendous blessing to them as they continue to launch in this. Uh, God has given them a wonderful facility that they're, they're meeting every Sunday. Um, they're sharing a facility with the church uh, in the, right in the heart of where they wanted to be. The Lord opened up that door, and they've got the whole lower level of the church, the Christian education classrooms and everything, and a sanctuary area for them to worship. And it is just so cool to be a part of that. And so I just want to encourage you to, to give and support them. And for those of you that know Pastor Peter, maybe you've got his phone number, you know who he is, shoot him a text every now and then and just say, hey man, we're praying for you and for Ryan and the boys. And uh, I know that will be a blessing to him. And I know this, if you're ever going to Nashville or going through Nashville, stop and see them. They'll take you to get some of that hot chicken they have in Nashville. Uh, they like that good hot chicken in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you want to be careful eating that stuff. That stuff can do a number on you. Uh, I can tell you that. Amen. So, but anyways, uh, we celebrate them, and we want to continue to lift them up in prayer and believe that God's going to do some great things in their ministry. I'm I'm glad that we could be a part of a ministry like that, aren't you? And I appreciate our church for doing that. Okay. Well, everybody, take a look at my awesome looking shirt and read what it says right there. Sir, this is our time of the year that we uh, kind of re-emphasize and renew our vision towards our ministry and our vision to Connect, Grow, Serve. For those of you that maybe are newer to the church, this is a vision statement or a mission that we launched at our church about four or five years ago. And it's been something that we've been dedicated to. Now, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. It's been a real challenge the last 16 months to accomplish this, especially the Connect part. But to us, that really even makes more the, the dependency upon the Holy Spirit so much more important because God has enabled us to still maintain those connections and still touch people's lives. For example, we didn't really have a strong um, internet audience. And so because families that are not able to come to the, you know, to the church because of maybe some uh, situations or because of their health, they're not ready to, to make that step into the house of the Lord. So right now, as we're speaking, we're broadcasting live, and every Sunday, we touch over a couple hundred people's lives, not just in Naples, but as far out, out. We have people in the Philippines that watch us. We've got a family in Alaska that watches us up in Michigan and Minnesota, so many different places that we get feedback from. So it's awesome that we can connect that way, and we can be a part of that. So for the next three months, as Dana mentioned, starting today, actually last Wednesday, because our first Wednesday service, we dedicated towards Connect. And so this morning, we're going to continue to do that. And I have a challenge this morning to us, uh, because I want to talk about something that really is going to have to kind of awaken you a little bit, because I think that uh, we've all kind of drifted a little bit when it comes to really locking in and thinking about what we're supposed to be doing as the believers and the church together as it relates to, you know, depending and connecting on one another. And so we're going to be talking this morning as we, we start for the month of September talking about connections. I want, to, I want to answer the question, why does unity matter? Why is it why unity matters and what that looks like? Now, let me ask you, how many are you familiar with the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, Luke 11, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That's the Lord's Prayer. Well, actually, if I can give you a little bit of, of truth and correction, and nowhere in the Bible does that say that's the Lord's Prayer. It might, on the subtitle of maybe some of the versions of the Bible, it might say the Lord's Prayer. But actually, if you ask scholars, and you ask a lot of people who really study the Scriptures and, and study the life of ministry, they will tell you that that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's actually the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is actually found in John 17. That was a very specific, a very passionate prayer that Jesus prayed. Now, the Lord's Prayer that we read in Matthew 9 and Luke 11, Our Father who art in heaven, that was kind of at the beginning of Jesus' ministry because the disciples were figuring out that Jesus was pretty awesome. And, and he was doing some awesome things. And they said, how are you doing this? And he said, it's with, through prayer. And they said, Lord, you know, teach us to pray. And so he taught them that model, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so really, that's why it's really the disciples' prayer, not the Lord's prayer. But Luke, 
our, our John 17 is truly the Lord's Prayer because it shows us the commitment that the Lord has as he prays. And let me tell you, the entire prayer of John chapter 17, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but I am going to take you through various verses, and I want you to see what was on Jesus' heart. Because I want you to pay attention that this is the last recorded prayer of Jesus. Other than when he was on the cross and he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. But as far as a, a, a moment that he was alone and he, had, he really anguished in prayer and, and John recorded this prayer, then I want you to hear what's on the heart of Jesus. And I want you to notice that we're going to see this in just a minute. The two times that Jesus is addressing this prayer in history. You'll see that in just a second. But I want you to notice. But here's the thing. The whole prayer centers around unity. That's what this whole prayer centers around. This whole prayer that Jesus prays centers around unity. So we're going to pick up from John chapter 17, verse 21. And I'm going to read this from two different translations, from the New Life Translation, and then we're going to read it from the God's Word Translation. So here's what it says in the New Life Translation. Jesus is praying. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you, or just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Let me read that again. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, just as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Now I'm going to read this from another translation, the good God's word translation. It says this, I pray that all these people continue to have unity in the way that you, Father, are in me and I am in you. And I pray that they may be unified with us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Wow, notice that. Jesus is praying this prayer. Unify them, just like you, Father, you and I, Jesus, the, uh, Jesus and the Father in heaven, God. They're unified. He said, make them one just like we are. And he says, and if that will happen, then the world will know that you sent me, and the world will believe that you sent me. Now, I want to go to something that Paul writes just quickly in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, because now Paul is living out the beginning of this prayer with taking the New Testament church, and he's reminding them, and he says, finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Okay, so, so Paul is reminding us basically a part of what Jesus prayed. He says, he says listen, he says, come together, rejoice together. And he, I, like the, I like the term, he says, aim for restoration. Make that the target of what you go for in ministry. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live peaceably, and the God of love and the peace will be with you. Now, it's interesting when you look at this prayer, because in John chapter 17, because as much as Jesus is passionate about the loss, as much as he is, desires to see the loss get won, this entire prayer is not about the lost. And you would think that would be the center of his last prayer. You would think that would be the message of his very last prayer on earth, that he would be praying, oh God, you know, you know uh, save souls and, and reach the souls. But he didn't. Instead, he made the focus of his last prayer towards the church. In fact, he was so intentional about this. In, in verse 9, he actually said, and I'm not praying for the world right now. I'm praying for believers. So when Jesus is praying this prayer, he's even telling God, he said, in this closing prayer, in this benediction of my ministry, I'm not praying for the unbeliever right now. I'm praying for the church. And the, the whole center around this thing is that he's saying, he says, I want you to unify them, and I want them to be one just as you and I are one. Now, when it comes to the most powerful characteristics of the church, of what the world should see in the church, it really comes down to two things. When the world looks at the church, there's two things that they need to make sure that they see in the church. They need to see the love, and they need to see the unity. Those are the two things that Jesus basically says that church, if you're going to do anything, make sure you display love and make sure you display unity. If the world looks at you and tries to figure you out, then make sure that they see that you, you love and you don't just love one another, but you even love the lost and you even love the unlovable. So he says that's one of the strongest characteristics of the church that a believer, when I say the church, I'm not just talking about Parkway life. I'm talking about every believer. 
when you're outside of the, the building, then, then the world needs to know. They need to see your love. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, said, by, my, by your love that you have, they'll know that you're my disciples. But he also wants us to know that we have to be unified. We have to make sure that the world sees that the church is one, that we're unified. Now, I know that's a challenge today because we've got so many different churches. We've got so many different beliefs. We've got so many different religious beliefs. And you know, you would think that it would be easy to bring churches together in a community and join together as one and say, hey, let's come together and let's, let's, believe, for our, our uni- let's believe for our community. We, we, we do it every so often as a community, the National Day of Prayer that we have in May. And several of the churches, Parkway Life, every year participates with that. I get to be a part of leading one of the prayers with that. I join once a month with about 10 or 12 pastors in this city right here alone at New Hope Ministries for lunch once a month, and us pastors come together. Not all the pastors, but many of them do. But I want to tell you something. It's, it's hard to get the pastors together in this community. It's hard to get the churches together in this community. And I, I, can I tell you something? And I think I'm safe to, to say this because I've been here for almost 15 years now. You know, I think sometimes some of the pastors and churches don't want to come together. It's because some of the churches that are existing today are split churches, and they, they, they split, wasn't planted, but they split. It was a bunch of people that got mad at the pastor, and they went and planted another church. And so there's some spiritual tension there. And, and so, so some of those pastors and some of those churches don't want to get together because there's some tension there. There's some, there's some unresolved issues there, and, and that certainly shouldn't be. When I think about how that today that we live in and the world is so desperate trying to find some understanding some answers, some assurance, then isn't it possible that these two things right here, love and unity, this is our opportunity right now to show the world that the church is truly a loving place. It's not a judgmental place. It's not a hypocritical club. It's not a hypocrite's club, but it it really is just a bunch of imperfect people trying to do the best that we can to love God and let his love flow through us into other people's lives, regardless of what they look like and live like. And then that they would see that the church is, we're unified, that we are one. Now, how many of you agree that's a pretty hard thing to do right now, <laughs> okay? All right. Um, and I guess the $64,000 question is, how can we do that? Specifically come together and be unified. How can the church have unity? Before we try to answer that, I think the best way to do that is to take a little bit of historical review. At the very first church, the, 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 the church of the book of Acts, and see in the New Testament church and kind of examine what they were like. Now, you know, I think sometimes we look at the New Testament church, the New Testament church, the book of Acts, and we see success. We see how that they came into the upper room, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and man, they just begin to grow, and, and, and the, the Lord added to the church every day. That's recorded several times in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, by the way, is just the actions of the early church. That's, it's the acts of the church. The acts of the early church is what it is, of the first church. And so when you read the book of Acts, you read this incredible success story, or you get this idea that, man, they just launched, and they just they took over the world, and they changed the world. And, and, and in reality, they did, but it was not an easy culture for them. It was a very different cult, difficult culture for them. And let me give you some of the challenges of the New Testament church. There was racial tension. There was a lot of racial tension in their community in, or in their culture at that time because you had different, you had different uh, because they were so close together and you had different groups of people and different tribes and different languages and different uh, ways of believing and different laws and, and different statuses of people. And so because of that, there was a lot of racial tension. I mean, we got a lot of racial tension in our world today, but they, they, they launched, they were a planted church. They were a new church in a time in a community, there was a ton of racial, racial tension. There was also a lot of persecution from the political and uh, religious hierarchies. And the thing about it is the two were kind of joined together. They weren't separate as they are today. But your, little, your political people and your religious leaders, that which were very religious structured, and I don't mean the religious followers of Jesus. I mean the religious followers of the Old Testament law that did not accept Jesus. They, they were the law. They were the people of influence. And there was a ton of persecution that was coming, especially against this early church. 
uh, you also had a very elite people. The, the Romans were very elite. They were, they were rich people, and, and they looked down on the poor. There was a disdain they had towards the poor, and there was no acceptance towards the poor whatsoever. Outsiders were given no place in their society. You could just come in and, and integrate into their culture. Uh, it was all about, you know, you know, uh, what you're, you know, uh, where you were born into, and and who's your daddy, <laughs> okay? And that was your status, okay? And so, so that 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 was a big part of the way that they uh, they snubbed a lot of people. There was a lot of cliques back then. Uh, and then the culture was very, believe this or not, but the culture was very promiscuous and sensual. Sexual sins were rampant, and that's why when you look at Paul's letters, he had to deal with all the time. And it wasn't just in the world, it was in the church. And we, we don't, you know, we can't imagine that because they didn't have the internet and they didn't have those things that just make sensuality and pornography and all those things. But let me tell you something, it was very crude. There was a lot of the things that we deal with in our culture today that was dealt with in their culture today. A lot of abuse in that area. And then as I mentioned a moment ago, politics and religion, feel, it was filled with corruption. So I want you to think about this. Here is this early, brand new church, a bunch of spirit-filled believers that have an encounter in the book of Acts chapter 1 and 2, get filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the world that they've got to step into. So here in the midst of this very godless society and a lot of religious bondage comes a church on the scene that begins to shake it all up. And I mean, they really begin to come and storm in. In fact, one of my favorite verses that kind of describes what was going on was in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, where it says, And these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. What a compliment. Man, these folks that are turning the world upside down, they've come here also. They, so they were going in region and communities, and they were shaking it up, man. I mean, they were making a lot of ruckus and making a lot of noise because they were proving through the, through the works of the Holy Spirit, through miracles taking place, through the signs of the supernatural. They were convincing people that Jesus was the Messiah, and they were convincing people that, that the message of truth was the gospel, and they needed to live by it. So, so we got to ask ourselves the question, how did they become so unified? What was it that they did, and, and what brought it about? Well, i tell you what brought it about. It was Jesus' prayer in, in, in John chapter 17. That started it. You know, I look at this prayer, and I look at the timeline, and we're going to bring it to, to 2021 here in just a minute, but I look at the timeline. And I can't help but imagine if Jesus would not have prayed this prayer. I believe the book of Acts is simply there because of John 17. I don't believe that there would be an entire book of Acts, 27 chapters, I believe it is. I don't believe that there would be a book of Acts if Jesus had not prayed this prayer in John 17. That's how important this prayer is. When you look at this, I want you to notice two things. In this prayer, Jesus is aiming this prayer towards two different times in humanity. Their day and today. Their day and today. Not really much of the prayer in between that, of that time frame. He's praying for those that are getting ready, and this is before the church's birth in the book of Acts. And Jesus is praying this prayer. And if you look at this prayer, you'll see that he's praying. His first petition of John chapter 17, he's praying for the church is getting ready to get birth. And then he shifts towards the end of John 17, and then he begins to pray for the finishers, the last group that's going to be here. Not much said about the in-between group. In fact, I want, to, I want you to see this. I want, to, I want you to see where Jesus prayed for those who were about to take over and start. And here's what he was praying. Because he was leaving, so now they're going to have to take over the Great Commission. He's saying, okay, listen, I, I came. I did what I'm supposed to do. Now you're going to go to the upper room, and you're going to receive power, and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, and your eyes are going to be open. You're going to begin to see my kingdom that I saw it as I was on this earth. And you're going to receive the anointing to do what I do. And he says, and you're going to do greater things than I did. Wow, that, that's a comparison right there. He says, you're going to do greater things. So, so that's why Jesus prays this prayer. And I want you to notice, I'm just, going to, just going to read this quickly and show you some of the verses of where he was praying for them, their day. Look at verse 6. He says, those you gave me. 
He's, he says, Lord, I'm praying for those. He's talking about those disciples, those followers that the Lord raised up and gave him while Jesus was on the earth. Verse 8, for I give them, for I gave them, I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Verse 9, I pray for them, and I'm not only praying for the world, but for those you have given to me. And verse 11, protect them by the power of your name. And look at some more of verse 11. So that they may be as one. Here he is again praying that that group, that early church, they would be unified. And verse 12, protect them and keep them safe. He prayed that three times over them. He said, verse 13, and give them full measure of my joy. Give them a lot of joy. You know why? Because you're getting ready to see in a minute. Because they had to face a lot of persecution. They were getting ready to go through a lot of ugly stuff. Because when we read the book of Acts, we read the fun part. We like to read the fun part. We don't like to read the hard part. We'll see a few, a little bit of that in just a minute before we close. And then verse 15, protect them from the evil one. Protect them because he knew that the evil one was going to do everything he can to stop what the Holy Spirit was starting to do in them. And then he said in verse 17, sanctify them by your word. So that's the prayer that he prayed for the early church. That's what he was saying to the starters. But now... In the middle of the prayer, he shifts, and he begins to pray for those that come behind the church, and then he even focuses on what I believe is our generation. I mean, I believe that, guys. I'm telling you, I'm 52 years old, but I really believe in my lifetime, I'm going to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture of the church. I'm going to still be a pastor when Jesus comes. I'm not going to be retired, and I'm not going to be in the grave. I I believe that we're going to be existing. I believe that's how close we are. And so that's why I really pay attention to this prayer. And I also pay attention to the early church. And we'll see this in a second. But now I want you to notice the prayer that he prayed when he prayed for those who, who finished the ministry. In John chapter 17. Look at this. Verse 20. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. Talking about the early group. He said, but I'm also praying for those who will believe in me through their message. That all them may be one. That they'll be one with another. Verse 21. That they, and may they also be in us as the world, so that the world will believe in us. In verse 22, may they be one as we are one. He said that again. In verse 23, he says so that they may be brought to complete unity. That the church would be brought into complete unity. Unity. And then verse 24, I think, is the, is the key to everything right here. He says, for they will see my glory. So it's almost like he's saying, if, if we can get the church unified and we can get them to love and we can get them on the same page, then they will see my glory just like the first church saw in the book of Acts. We will see his glory. You know, I want to tell you something. Performance is not what's going to bring the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ down in our church. And we, we get pretty good at it. In fact, we've been working to kind of polish it, but yet that's not going to bring the glory of the Lord. It's when we come together. All right, so now you can see why this is a real hard message for me to preach when we've been told to, to distance from one another and, and not come to church and, and not have extracurriculum activities. We got to be isolated. Now I want to say this: I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that nothing but a bunch of bad stuff has happened through all this. I was talking to when I was at um, Dustin Rattencrantz's uh, 40th birthday several weeks ago. His brother came up to me, Josh, and uh, we were talking about you know the, the, when when everything was shut down and you know nobody could work, and Josh was telling me how that he had to um, he had to stay home to work at home, and he kind of traveled a lot with his company, and his wife's got a business here, and I remember we were standing there talking at the birthday party, and he said, Pastor, he said, you know what, he said, I know a lot of people kind of hated, you know, when we had to all lock down and go home, but he said, man, it was beautiful for our family. He said, he said, I, I worked hard. I, I produced more for our company. Our company actually made more when I was working from home, and he said, the best part was, he said, we grew so much together as a family. We got, we all kind of got back on our roles and we got back on our kids' lives. And I thought, you know, that's true. That, 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 that happened for a lot of us. Uh, Of course, if you like your spouse, that's, that's what happened. If you didn't, then you, you couldn't wait till the, uh, 
Let me tell you something. You know you got a marriage problem when you're wearing your mask in your house and your spouse is sitting next to you, okay? All right. Either that or you got simple halitosis, okay? So, uh, all right, so, so it hasn't been all bad, but, but bigger picture in the bigger picture, and I'm not here to bring a political side to this. This is not where I'm going with this. But in the bigger picture, we see how that the church has struggled now, I don't have time to go into st- to the statistics today to talk to you about how that there's been a tremendous decline, that when churches first opened back up after we had to shut down, that in the first, I think it was eight weeks, only 30, across the nation, there was only a 37% return rate of people coming back to the house of the Lord. And we were a little bit higher than that, but we still haven't got everybody back, okay? And then there were statistics about people that just got out of the habit of coming to church which is totally against what the Bible says in Hebrews when he says, make it a habit as you see the day coming. A lot of people fell out of church. And so the, the, in, in, church experts will tell you today that the church, when it comes to the attendance, has been on a decline. When it comes to the connection, the church has been on a decline. When it comes to the service of the church to the community, the church has kind of been on a decline. Now here we are today in a very unusual time. And when we measure where the church started to where we are today, separate other than just a pandemic, there really wasn't much different. And really, I think they had a bigger challenge because they didn't have a church. They were the first church. They didn't have the organization and the structure. They didn't have the heritage to kind of help get them through the challenges that they faced. So everything about the Old Testament or the New Testament church was an uphill thing. So we read this prayer in John chapter 17, and I want to just interject this real quick. Jesus today is still praying for his church. When he went to his father, guess what he went up there for? Not just to sit down and watch and see how it all plays out. He didn't go up there, and he's not sitting on the sidelines watching and observing to see how it went. But he's still praying. And he's still praying for Parkway Life Church. And he's still praying for Pastor Randy and Pastor Dana and, and the staff and the elders and the leaders and, and the, 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 the fellowship and the members of this congregation. He's still praying for this community. He's still praying for the world. He's still praying for the church. He's still interceding for the church. He's not into this prayer. And so this is still in the heart of God to unify the church. And so, so let's now begin to answer the question, what will bring unity to the church. So what I'm going to tell you is not a plan. It's not a program. It's not a 16-week church growth campaign of friend day and, and, and family day and all these kind of things. Well, those are fun to do, but that in itself is not going to bring unity because you can have a crowd, but you don't necessarily have people in unity with a crowd. How do you unify the hearts? How do you get everybody on the same page Understanding the same mission, experiencing the same move of God, and experiencing the power and the glory of God. Well, to answer the question, we got to go back and look at the New Testament church. And here's what they did. I'm going to show you what they did because I believe it is the solution. It is the answer. It is how we will get the job done. The first thing, and these are not necessarily in any particular order. Okay, but I will say that this is probably the most important one. Number one was they prayed together. And then he just pray. They pray together. Okay, I find it interesting that that Jesus is standing there in Matthew. Matthew 14, 15, 16, 17 was this incredible time when Jesus is really having this finale time with his disciples, getting ready to go to the cross, getting ready to you know, give them the commission, and, and, and he's, he's wrapping things up with his disciples, kind of giving them the final orientation. And, and he says, and he tells them, he says, look, you know, I want you to go to the upper room. And that's how the book of Acts starts, Acts chapter 1. He says, I want you to, on the day of Pentecost, I want you all to get together, and I want you to worship and pray, and I want you to come together because something's going to happen in that moment. He could have said, now, you guys, I understand there's a lot of persecution. I, I know there's going to be a lot of people that's going to hate you because of me. So secretly go in your homes and synchronize your sundials, okay? And, and everybody... At 6 a.m. and 12 noon, 
you guys all pray, okay, in your home secretly. But he didn't tell them that. That would have been convenient, and that would have been easy. But I got to think there was something about him telling, no, you guys need to come together and pray. Yeah, you can pray at home, and you, you better be praying at home. You better not just be praying at church or when the church prays. But, but he says, there's something special that I will to do when you make a sacrifice and you come together and you pray. Let me show you some verses about this, okay? Acts chapter 1, verse 14. And they all joined together constantly in prayer. Remember, we're looking at the book of Acts. John 17, the book of Acts. Couldn't have the book of Acts without John 17. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Guess what they were doing? They were in prayer. And suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves together to pray. Acts 4, verse 24. They raised their voices together in prayer to God. Acts chapter 8, verse 15. And when they arrived in Samaria, they prayed together for new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit. I could go on and on. So many verses in the book of Acts to show you that believers coming together to pray. Let me tell you one of the worst things that America culture did, and it's not as bad in some other cultures, but it's horrible in America. We have replaced the mission of the church becoming a prayer-driven church to a worship-driven church, a celebratory church. Let's come together and let's have a Jesus party. And we'll have a little prayer. We'll, you know, maybe start the service with prayer and, and the worship team gets together and prays before the service and here and in my office. And, and of course, now we're putting time in prayer in the service But Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And then if you celebrate and somebody preaches, then that's just a bonus. But the New Testament church, when they came together as a church, they preached, they worshiped, and and, and they spent time, and they made a commitment to come together to pray. And I hear people say, well, it's just a long drive to have to come over to church just to pray for an hour. And, you know, it's just not, you know, I I could pray from home. Well, you should, and you can, and I hope you do. That's why we, we provide these opportunities for prayer. That's why we've, we've, re, we've kind of vamped it up with the, the prayer time you see we do on Sunday mornings with the Scripture, being very specific in the needs. The third Wednesday of the month of our time of worship and prayer rally, the, the Tuesday morning prayer at 930, the prayer time that we have at 7, 8, 7 p.m. On, on Fridays. That's just a few that we have. I'm going to tell you something, and I don't mean to sound like a, 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 a wild prophet, but if this nation comes under true calamity, I guarantee you our prayer meetings will fill up. And we don't want to wait till we get to that point to come to pray together. I'm going to challenge you. I know not everybody come Tuesday morning because I know most people work. And God, we love our, we love our Friday nights. But you got Saturday night. So if you want to go bowling and if you want to go out to eat and go have a date, food's really better on Saturday nights than it is Friday night anyways. More crazies are out on Fridays. Join us for prayer at 7 o'clock. Make it a commitment. Put it on your calendar. Pray together. That's what the church, that's what the early church did. They they came together and they prayed together. And the other thing that they did was they worshiped together. Look at just a couple of verses here. Acts chapter two, verse forty-seven. Every every day, every day they came together, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every single day these people came together. And they worshiped the Lord. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Every day in the house of God and in the homes, they kept teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ. They would come together. They would worship together. That brought unity when we worshiped together. I know that um, our, you know, worship has really become a, um, um, it's really become a cultural fix in churches. A lot of people are, looking for a church, and they kind of have a checklist. They want to know, okay, what's their worship like? 
Is it liturgical? Do they have a pipe organ and somebody that stands like this and sing from songbooks? Or do they have a worship team? Do they have lights and guitars and instruments? And is it loud? Is it soft? Do they sit? Do they stand? And, you know, we, we kind of, we, we do kind of like it live and loud. Okay? We kind of like it live and loud. We, we, we like to have worship and we enjoy that. And that's just kind of our style. But we also enjoy the quiet moments and we just enjoy jumping into a liturgical song and just bringing our styles into it and offering it unto the Lord. And so that's kind of who we are in worship. But, but we should never choose a church based upon if we like the music or not because when we do, we are now saying the worship is about us and not about him. And when people are like, well, I don't like that song. Well, it wasn't to you. It was to him. We're not singing it to you. I prayed this morning when the worship team prayed. I said, Lord, you are the audience, not us and not the people out here. You are the audience, and we are just all together worshipers. You're part of the worship team. Do you know that? Some of y'all say, well, I can't sing. I know we hear some of you. No, I'm joking. And I know you're thinking, well, some of y'all can't sing up there either. I know. I get it. All right. We're not the best either. But we're, we're part of the worship. We're all the worship team. We're all just part of that worship team. That's what we do. And so they worship together. Okay, let me jump to number three. The third thing they did, there's four points, so we'll land the plane here in a second. The third thing they did was they served together. They didn't just pray together. They didn't just show up at church. But then they knew the church had a mission. And so everybody bought into the mission of this. And Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 3 9. We are co-labors together. We all signed up for it, so we're all part of the team. Acts chapter 4, verse 44 and 45. And all those who put their trust in Christ were together and shared what they owned. And as, as anyone had need, they sold what they owned and shared with everyone. So, so everybody found their part. And Paul spends a whole lot of time talking about this in Acts chapter, I mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 14, 12, 13, 14, throughout other letters where he talks about we're all members of the same body and we all have a separate function. Okay, now, I'm going to ask for some grace and mercy right now because I'm going to be a really, really mean pastor. So will you, some of y'all are going to love me and some of y'all are going to be like, oh, he just made me mad. He, I was supporting him until just now and I'm not coming to Pastor Appreciation Day two weeks because of what he just is about to say, okay? I know I'm putting myself on the line here, okay? But I want to say something from a pastor's heart. And I try to be very kind and I try to be very diplomatic when I say things. But you know, a pastor's job is to protect the sheep. And... One area that I think I need to do a better job when it comes to protecting the sheep is protecting those people that are doing too much. Too much in the church. And so I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to protect some of the people that you are doing way too many things in the church. I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to get on those who ain't doing anything. Because that's why they're doing so much. Because we got so many that are doing so little. Now, I know, I, I get it. I understand the, the pandemic thing. But I think we kind of got into a habit of letting others do it. I'm going to say that again. I think we got in a habit of just coming and letting others do it. Now, can I tell you this? The, the, the bigger picture of this and the sad part about this is when we just let other people do it. And not everybody's sharing and taking on some of it. It hinders the ability for unity to come in the body. We can't really get unified. The ones who are working together are unified. But we're all coming together, and sometimes you can feel it in the spirit, the atmosphere, because we just don't know. You know, you're not going to know. You're not going to get to know people in this church if all you do is just come to a worship service. You're not going to get to know who your brother and sister is. You're not going to really get. You're not going to become your brother and sister. They're just going to be another person who attends the church that you go to. They're not going to be your brother and sister. And I want to say this, to, and I don't mean this to slam those because I know, and I appreciate those who who are watching every week and say, Pastor, you know, we're getting closer. Our health is getting better, and we'll be back in the house of the Lord. But I want to tell you something: if you are watching the service and you're not coming to church and you're not serving out of convenience. When you know you can, then I, I think you need to reevaluate your priorities. You say, well, I'm still connected to the church online. You might be connected to us, but we're not connected to you. 
We're talking about connection. We're talking about unifying. Everybody can do a little something. And part of the reason why I think we, we burn out and we lose some of our workers is because they're trying to fill in the gaps where other people should be stepping up. Okay, y'all still love me? Okay, I hope so. I love you too. All right. You know, the other benefit is when we're serving together, it makes, it makes, it makes, it makes life fun. My, my former overseer in Ohio, Jimmy D. Smith, told the funniest story. He talked about when his dad took him and his boys fishing as a kid. He said his dad had a john boat, and they were fishing in his lake. And they got some, some night crawlers and little fishing poles. And they pushed the boat out, and they went out to the lake. And, and uh, I think there was three boys, and the dad was in a boat, like a 16-foot john boat. And they're all sitting there. And three boys. Now, I can remember because I got two brothers. Three boys. It was three boys in our house, too. And so the dad was just so proud. He, the, the boys were just getting along. You, you guys know. You got three boys. You understand what I'm getting ready to say. They were just getting along, and they, and they were just catching fish. And Oh, look at the one you caught. And they were just celebrating each other. And then what happened was, all of a sudden, the fish quit biting. And then the kids started getting irritable. And then they started rocking the boat. And, and then the dad had to end the day and get the boys out of the boat. And he said, all right, we're done. Because now all they were doing was picking on each other, nagging on each other, uh, just getting on each other's nerves. And, and the dad said, we're done. And he got him out of the boat. And, and Jimmy D. Smith, my bishop, he said, you know, he said, as long as we were catching fish, we were all getting along. But the moment we quit catching fish, that's when we started getting on each other's nerves. I think the church is the same way. As long as we're winning people and catching fish, we seem to be getting along. But the moment we quit winning people to Christ, we start getting in each other's business and start creating, we start rocking the boat. That's some good preaching right there. I'm going to end with this point here. Not only did they pray together and they worship together and they serve together, but they suffered together. Um, I cringe, and I get it. I understand we live personal lives, and we don't want our business out there in front of everybody and stuff like that. But I can't tell you how many times I've had members of the church will call me, and there's an urgent need in their life, their family, of, of all sorts. And, and I hear every now and then people say, Pastor, I don't want the church to know about this. This is something very personal, but it's a real big struggle we're going through. And I get it. I understand. I really do. But a lot of times I try to steer them away from that. And I try to say, you know, I get it. I understand you're not real comfortable at, at, at you know, sharing and making that stuff known, but I think you need to reconsider that. Yeah, but it's embarrassing. I know. And you know what motivates me to say that a lot of times? Several things. First of all, it's because I want them to know that there's greater strength and healing and support when you got a larger number of people around you. The second thing is, it's because we have a tendency when we're in that place to think that we're the only one going through something. And we make the assumption that I don't want to tell anybody because everybody else's lives is good and our lives is falling apart. What you might be surprised, because I'm a very confidential person, is I'm, as I say, you know, I know nobody else is going through it. And I'm like, oh, you don't know. And I'm thinking, if you only knew half the people that on your row is going through the same thing, but they told me the same thing, don't tell anybody. We're all going through something. All of us. The New Testament church, I think this was one of the greatest unifiers, was their suffering. They suffered together. And I, I said a moment ago, we read the book of Acts and we think, oh man, they just got together and just had camp meeting in church. And can you imagine if they had a television ministry, how much money they were probably raising and how awesome and all the choirs. And I bet you they had Israel Holton coming in and singing and boy, they just had worship and it was just like glorious. And no, they were really out of the gate. They were seeing a lot of great things, but out of the gate. 
they went through some suffering. I'm at 27 chapters, I think, in the book of Acts. And in chapter 4, we already find out that Peter and John are now arrested. Pastor Peter and Pastor John are now getting arrested for preaching truth and preaching the gospel. And the whole church began to feel that. Acts chapter 6, Stephen, one of the newer disciples, gets arrested and they stone him to death. Acts chapter 8 and 9, we read that Christians were being arrested. They were going into their homes and arresting them and putting them in prison, doing that to Christians. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were beaten and persecuted in, in, in Philippi for preaching the gospel, preaching truth. That's just some of the stories in, in, in Scripture. And I love the attitude of the apostles in all of this. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, verse 11, or verse 41, when the apostles left the Sanhedrin courtroom after they were flogged and after they were beaten for preaching the gospel, here's what they said. We are just thankful that we were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. They were like, man, Jesus, somebody here preaching the gospel. Look what we get. We get persecuted. They're like, thank you, Lord, that we can, we can share in what you went through. That's why Paul said, I might know him not only in the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. They suffer, but they suffer together. There's been some suffering in this house. There's been a lot of people that suffered over the last 16 months. But it's amazing when we go through it. It's amazing what happens when we come together. You know, you know why unity matters? I'll end this with, I'm going to tell you three reasons quickly why unity matters. I'm just going to read it. Number one, it's the only way the church is going to get the job done. It is the only way the church is going to get the job done. Number two, it's the only way that the church is going to have the blessing of the Lord because the Bible says in Psalms 133, verse 3, for the Lord commanded the blessing where there's unity. The Lord commands the blessing, and he says the blessing is life forevermore. And number three, it's the only way that we can make it through what's going to be coming our way. That's the only way we're going to make it. So really, unity is not an option. It's not an option. It is a must. It is a must for the church to get the job done. It is a must for us to know that we got the blessing of the Lord and the favor of the Lord. And it's a must for us so that we can make it through the times that are ahead of us that if we are in the last days and we are the last church, then trust me, we're going to go through some tough things. And unity is going to do it. And I put my money on the fact that if the early church made it through, because of those things, we can do it too. This is why we cannot come apart, but we need to come together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Stand with me together, and I'm going to read this verse as you're standing. This, this verse is a verse that only could be read and applied to those that will be in the last days. This specific verse only, it doesn't apply for the whole church of history. It only, this verse only applies to the church that will be existing in the final days. This verse right here. And let us not give up on the habit of meeting together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see the day of the Lord is coming nearer. That's the instruction. Got, if you've gotten comfortable missing church, skipping church, one of the things that we're noticing with the trends, and it's our church and almost every other church, people that were on the average of coming four times a month are now coming three. People that were coming three times a month are now coming twice a month. People that are coming twice a month are now coming about once a month. That's almost a consistent average of what we see taking place. That's completely opposite of that verse. You say, Pastor, you're just trying to get more people in the pews. Yeah. I'm trying to get us together. I'm trying to get us unified because we're stronger. We're better. 
we, the enemy can do less damage. And we can do more for Christ when we're unified together. I, I, I challenge you. Let's pray together. Let's, let's make worship a big part of what we do. Let's, let's make sure that we, we serve. Everybody finds their place and serve. We'll be talking about that more when we get to the serve month. And in our suffering, let's not hide it. Let's draw from one another the strength of that. Father, this morning as I stand here in prayer, I, I lift up like you did. I pray for the church. I'm not praying for the world right now. I'm praying for the church. I'm praying for Parkway. I'm praying for the families of this house. This has been the most transitional, longest transitional season I think I've ever seen humanity go through. So much transition. It's been weird. But Father, I know that you're still present and you're still at work and you're still available to do what you are believing and asking your Father to do in your people in your church. And Lord, today as I close this prayer, I, I pray right now for those that are hurting in this church that they not only come to me, but Lord, they, they come to the body. I'm limited, and, and I, can't, I can't do it all anyways, Lord. Together, Lord, we can do this. I pray for the hurting in this church that's going through hardships. I pray for the weary in our house in this church. I pray, God, that in prayer and in worship and service, they're going to find a newfound strength, the joy that you prayed over your church in, Act, in John 17. I pray for those that God that have become complacent and kind of got on the sidelines, sitting in the stands rather than on the field, still showing up, but just they're not, they're not players. I appreciate people rooting us on, but God, it means so much more when we get on the field and we serve together. I pray, Lord, that whatever's caused that person, maybe they're afraid of ministry or maybe they feel unqualified. Or maybe they bought into this idea, well, i got to get more things together before I can get on the team. That's a lie of the enemy. I pray, God, that you will call each of us, Lord, to our personal responsibility of service. We'll step up. Even if we're, maybe we're saying, well, I'm just waiting for somebody to ask. Lord, you're asking, you're commanding. Just, just the people will just step up and do it. I pray, God, that you will make that the culture of our church and our people. And then finally, Lord, I pray for that person that's in this room that doesn't know you or they have walked away from you, God. I ask you in Jesus' name that they will take this moment and they would surrender their heart and life to you and they would accept you right now as their Lord and personal Savior. You would forgive them of their sins. You would break the stronghold, destroy the work of the enemy. If there's chains and if there's bondages, you would break it off their life. And I declare in Jesus' name that this church is going to rise up and step into our greatest days. That's coming. And we declare that and we believe that in the name of Jesus. And let all God's people say amen. Amen, amen. amen. Before you're dismissed, Brother Daniel's going to come and close us in prayer. We're going to pray. He's going to pray for their offering. Let me remind you to give a special offering.